Welcome to part 8 of your Physical Geography online course. This part introduces Unit 19, the last unit of this text. Uh, this content area is introducing glacial geomorphology, or how have glaciers changed our earth and landscapes. So the first thing that we'll be learning about is really the formation of glacial ice and how long it takes. So just because we have a little bit of snow on the upper parts of our mountains does not uh, designate them to be glaciers. We're looking at not just decades, but centuries of ice that have been able to withstand melting. Snow that's been able to, well, fresh snow to begin is called powder because it's really dry. It's mostly ice crystals. And then snow that's been able to withstand an entire melt year and is able to celebrate a one-year birthday, we can identify as fern. But then after that, we're looking at decades on decades of decades of snow that need to accumulate in the upper reaches of these mountains for us to be able to identify it as being a glacier. Glaciers move based off of the deformation and sheer weight that they accumulate through the compacted ice, and so they move downward. In that process, they're carving and plucking. It's very weird to think that even though ice is a solid, it moves very much like a liquid. And that being the case, as it slowly moves from its highest point, usually formed within a cirque, it moves down, moving material, plucking, carving these very large U-shaped valleys. When I think of glacial environments, I think the best one that's within our reach is going to be the Yosemite Valley. Very steep walls, very nice U-shaped trough in which that ice had moved. Also to remember that when we talk about glaciers, these are very, very large things, massive amounts of ice. In fact, so much ice during our last ice age, more than 10,000 years ago, that most of North America was being pushed into the ocean. And that is really when you start looking at the study of maybe Florida in particular as to why the Florida Keys and along the Panhandle has a lot of coral reef is because there was so much ice in northern North America that it actually pushed Florida under the ocean and allowed for coral reefs to develop and flourish. So it's really a big piece of our history. Uh, we also know through uh, the advances of climate change, long-term amounts of, of change that we've been able to study, that we see tremendous amounts of land ice melting and going into the ocean. Uh, we are seeing the rates in which it's occurring rapid. In fact, there is a, a video linked, it's a TED-Ed video called Chasing Ice, and he kind of gives an example. I think that his video is a great video because he is not a scientist. He is a photographer. He worked for National Geographic, and he understands that there is climate change, that things are changing globally. But he needed to see change. And he needed to see lots of it, not just a picture here and a picture here and go, look, they're different. He wanted to see a progress, a progression of change. And that's what he did. He worked uh, and he was able to obtain lots of time-lapse cameras in which have taken photos over years looking at large ice sheets. And he was able to then record the world's largest calving event ever witnessed by man. Um, it was enough, he watched within an hour, enough ice break off of a glacier and fall into the ocean that is larger than the, the lower part of Manhattan. So it's really a great video to watch to see that perspective and to see that the, the as he likes to say, the, the most beautiful but yet terrifying thing that is happening within our environment at this current time. Things that you'll progress with, uh, again, is you'll learn about the development of glaciers, how they carve U-shaped valleys. We'll learn about alpine glaciers. We'll look about valley glaciers. We'll even discuss continental glaciers, things that cover very large, vast, you know, hundreds of square kilometers. We'll look at the features found within. You'll talk about cirques, moraines, arets. You'll move down further down and look at the different types of drumlins, eskers, canes, lots of new vocabulary. Again, they get kind of lumped into the family of either being uh, caused by erosion or deposition. So that idea of erosion, transportation, those golden three that we've seen in these last few videos becomes very prominent in these types of environments. Things also to think about uh, as you work through this uh, is not just the uh, identification of these features, but really understand their sheer size, that they're massive. Uh, if you've ever had the pleasure or, or opportunity to be able to drive up to Mammoth in California, right before you get up to Mammoth, there's uh, on the west side, there's an off turn for a place called Convict Lake. Convict Lake is a beautiful lake. It gets its name because it had a long history of convicts that escaped and fell into the ice, but nonetheless, 
Uh, it's a very round lake. Well, the convict lake is what we call a tarn. Tarns are lakes that are found, glacial lakes, that are found after a glacier has completely been uh, you know, evaporated and removed. And it's found in the bottom of a cirque. A cirque is the first place a glacier forms, and the, you know, the first place to freeze, last place to melt. Well, as you're driving up that road to Convict Lake, you'll notice that there's hills that parallel the road, kind of do this type of pattern. Well, those aren't hills. Those are moraines. So imagine if you stick your hand in the sand and you're pushing the sand away and your hand represents the glacier and you move all that sand, pushing it far away, all those ridges on either side of you pushing it are really piles of glacial debris. And they look like hills to us, but from a bird's eye view, you go, wow, no, I can see as if the glacier was able to push through like a bulldozer and move all that material, you can then see it. And there's ways for us to study it. We can look at the material that's been deposited. We can look at whether it's been uh, consolidated, whether it has striations, or if it's just a, a big pile of debris that doesn't make any sense. We can look at the different types of um, material that has been dropped and how far it has traveled. I've never been. Perhaps you have been to New York Central Park. Central Park has these beautiful rocks that are, that are in within this park that have very large glacial striations or scratches from glaciers that not only do the striations give us an idea as to what direction those rocks were then transported and moved to, but the geology of the rocks let us know how far they came because those rocks have an orogeny of perhaps not just miles but tens of hundreds of miles away in which those rocks were then dropped into New York. So it's really, you know, when you walk away from this glacier idea, this whole process, is that these are huge things, massive. In fact, probably if you look at, at um, deserts, rivers, coastal environments, glaciers are the biggest because they can be continental. Sure, we can have a river that runs from you know, one side to the other, but when we think about the glacial troughs that are carved, they're just monumental and huge. So I really hope that you get to enjoy this chapter and, and do check out the videos that I've shared. It really is a great example of how our landscape here in California has been carved. It's hard, it's, you know, California is an amazing place. It really is. You can go to the beach and go snowboarding in the same day. And when we step back and look at, well, what about our last glaciation? Just about 10,000 years ago in the late Pleistocene, what was being carved? What was being deformed in our landscape that we get to enjoy now, such as Mammoth Mountain? Well, we get to observe this. We get to study it. In fact, some new research has come out that closer to Los Angeles, because we used to just think that it was pretty much, you know, moving up to Mammoth was the greatest example of some of this glaciation, but we start to find that in this case, that there's even some glaciation that's been observed and, you know, that's quite old, up in the San Gabriels behind Pasadena. So it really is more local to us than we think. But again, it's just hard for us to observe it because we don't deal a lot with these glaciers. And as climate changes, we're discovering that places that have once had active glaciers are no longer going to have them in the future. You know, it won't be, um, it won't be Glacier National Monument and Park for too much longer if the warming events continue to occur. Because what ends up happening is that if the rate of deflation, if the rate of melt exceeds that of accumulation, the glacier cannot survive, which means it will just continue to melt and evaporate until we have nothing left. So, big picture, lots of really large, incredible features, and I really hope you get to enjoy this one, and if you haven't been to Yosemite, you should go soon and be able to then relate what you're seeing within this text into the real world. We'll talk soon.